All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the January 25th, 2023 board meeting of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. I am Laura Anderson. I am the chair of the trust, and I'd like to ask our board members to introduce themselves. Uh, perhaps we'll start with uh, Senator Anderson as our, one of our non-voting members. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Dick Anderson, uh, Senate District 5, happened to live in uh, Lincoln City and uh, the primary Senate district uh, takes care of the Oregon coast and into uh, Benton County to Philomath. So uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for joining us. Is there, um, is one of these squares Representative Gomberg or one of his staff persons? Okay, uh, we'll go with, um, how about Christina, Steve, Christine, and then Karina. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, Senator. I'm so glad to see you, and thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Christina Volnikovsky, and I am a trust board member. Thank you, Christina. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson, Senator Anderson. Uh, my name is Steve Marks. I am also a uh, member of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. Thanks for have thanks for everybody for being here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I I think I'm the next one. I <laughs> I missed the sequence there. Christine Moffat um, from Coos Bay, a member of the or Oregon Science Trust. It's great to to be there uh, at least virtually today with all of you on a beautiful sunny day on the South Coast. I think I'm up next. Uh, Karina Nielsen. Uh, I'm the director of Oregon Sea Grant based at Oregon State University, Newport and Corvallis and a member of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. Great. Thank you all. I don't think we'll go through a full, full suite of introductions today. We have a lot on the agenda. I would like to um, at this time, uh, ask, uh, I, I want to recognize um, DSL staff um, and maybe ask them uh, to introduce themselves, please. I can go first. Hi, I'm Jean Strait, and I'm the deputy director at DSL for administration. So I want keep an eye on your budget. That's how I. I'm connected to you guys. Thank you, Jean. And Linda? I'm Linda Safina Massey, and uh, just help out with some of the administrative minutes and such. I think I see Erin is on. Hello, um, Aaron Smith. I am the executive assistant to the director for Department of State Lands, and I'm just here um, as to listen in and as a backup for Linda. Great, and I wanna thank all three of you for your support of the Ocean Science Trust. I certainly could not imagine doing this without your oversight. Uh, Linda has been preparing our meeting summaries, uh, which we have three to approve. And Jean, um, as she said, keeps an eye on the budget. Aaron assisting with all of these contracts for the um, the great work that we've been able to accomplish in the last couple of years. So thank you all. Um, and so uh, board members, have you had a chance to review the meeting summaries that were sent for, um, there were three months, April, June, and July? I had a chance to review the meeting summaries. I found them uh, to be clear and accurate. Did any board members need to request any clarifications or changes or updates to those summaries? No, I found them to be clear as well. Great, good job, Linda. Thank you. I know that was something that 
you took a lot of care in, and it's nice to have the recordings of these meetings so that you don't have to actually record and articulate all of the uh, scientific presentations that we've received in the last year. So um, that said, I would entertain a motion to approve. I think we could include all three summaries in one motion. I move that we accept the summaries as written for all three um, summary for our minutes of the meetings. And I second. Great. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And motion passes. And right. uh, Chair, Laura, the uh, yes. Senator has his hand up. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Laura, I hate to interrupt, um, but I, I, I'm going to have to jump shortly. But what I wanted to do was introduce uh, someone who's on the line. Uh, Megan Davis is uh, on the line. I, I've asked her to sit in to uh, cover uh, Representative Gomberg and I. Um, she is actually uh, working with the Coastal Caucus this session. Uh, uh, C. Grant Fellow, and uh, so she's very interested, as you can imagine, with uh, ocean activities, and uh, I think looks forward to, uh, you know, participating and at least absorbing the information. So I didn't want you to think we had a, a, a carpetbagger there. She's she's <laughs> looking good. Great. Welcome, Megan. Uh, pleasure to have you on the call and look forward to working with you. Um, Senator Anderson, are there any updates regarding the session or anything that you're working on that you wanted to communicate before you have to go? Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, we're into the second week. And as you can imagine, uh, bills are flowing uh, and being assigned to committees. Um, uh, and, you know, nothing at this point has uh, jumped out. Um, but, you know, again, it, it helps having uh, someone like Megan that uh, pulls those bills across um, and you know we're taking a look at we the coastal caucus will be taking a look at that but if if anybody has um, you know information or a heads up it certainly would help the representative Gomberg and I uh, but I think it's it's normal as one would expect in week two all right yes very early yet and we will be discussing on our agenda what we um, see as the most pressing needs and priorities for any asks in this biennium. I recognize we didn't meet the early filing deadlines, but we hope that you and the representative would entertain a one pager concept that we could still introduce before the end of session if need be. Yes, um, I'll, I'll save a priority bill for you. <laughs> Wonderful, glad to hear that, thank you. All right. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Dubrucier, who is our contractor for the for many things, all of our projects actually, both the ocean acidification and hypoxia package, and more pertinent to this agenda, the near shore uh, RFPs. So she's going to lead us through a presentation of a little bit of the background, the status, and cue us up for some um, decisions and motions regarding awardee selection. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here today. I think before I kick off uh, this short presentation, I just want to acknowledge it's really been an, an honor um, to serve on behalf of the OOST to help shepherd this process. Uh, and it's been very engaging with many of the experts that we've had throughout the process. So I'll just jump right into it and talk about the 2022 process uh, to get us to the Oregon Near Shore Ocean Grants. Hey, Lisa, so, look at yeah. that really cool logo on your cover slide. Do you want to yes. go point back? that out really quick? <laughs> yeah, let's go back and point that out really quick because that was a... <clears throat> That was a really great thing that you helped us facilitate. Yeah, so we were thinking our web page could use a little bit of a, a fresh look with the logo, um, with a, a focus on uh, the water, the ocean, the wave, and the science, and tried to make that come together with a graphic artist. Um, 
And this is what we have for you. <laughs> yeah, I reviewed um, three rounds, probably 15 or more options that this artist created. So I hope that you find the selection. It's just, it's just simple, solid, and I think we'll add to our recognizability in the state and the region. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, it's really it's uh, it's really simple, and I love the magnifying glass that <laughs> also represents the O of Oost. <laughs> All right. So the Oregon Nearshore RFP process. Um, just to remind everybody, um, this was funding provided by House Bill fifty two o two. It provided a million dollars for science and monitoring on nearshore keystone keystone species. And you can see the list that went with it. Sea otters, nearshore marine ecosystems, kelp and eelgrass habitat, and sequestration of blue carbon were several of the menus of opportunity that were presented as part of this House Bill 5202. So as part of that, um, the OOST made the decision to um, have $600,000 of that dedicated to uh, data collection, nearshore data collection, uh, 200,000 for data modeling and $100,000 for a data portal, um, of which 10,000 was discussed initially to do an initial assessment. And then uh, 100,000 of the million was put towards OOST administration to help manage all of the grant programs, grant funding and everything that the OOST does. So the timeline for all of this, we announced the grants on October 1st of 2022. Uh, on December 1st, 2022 was the original grant deadline, but we ended up extending that for two weeks um, for a variety of reasons, but there was a misalignment of one element of the RFP on what was on the website and what was in the actual um, RFP itself. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had a fair opportunity um, to include that information in their grant proposal. So we went back to the two or three grants that had been submitted by December 1st, that those folks know that they had a chance to make any modifications by December 15th, and then we extended the, the grant deadline. It was really nice for us to do that anyway, because it really did give folks um, an opportunity to put more time into their grant proposals. And we got a great suite, as you will see, um, of proposals that were received. So on January 17th of 2023, the proposals were reviewed and scored. And of course, we are here today to look at uh, the results of that process. But I would be remiss if I did not mention all of the different people that were involved in the RFP development. So when we first developed the RFP categories of nearshore data collection and data modeling in the data portal, we convened five different experts um, to help share with us, review, review past documents, review the Ocean Science Summit report from 2016, um, review a lot of priority documents now in terms of Oregon's nearshore strategy, et cetera. And they did an initial filtering of those documents and recommended those three initial categories um, to be funded. Once that was done, we pulled in another panel of experts, um, and you can recognize some of the cast of characters as board members in the second group who were extremely helpful, especially from a scientific standpoint of looking at the draft RFP that we developed and then providing additional input and guidance uh, on its composition and content. And then lastly, um, once we put out the bids and got all of the um, proposals back in, we pulled together a West Coast panel of experts um, and those folks reviewed and scored the proposals based on the criteria that were established, which aligned with the RFP itself. I also want everybody to know that each one of these reviewers um, did sign a conflict of interest disclosure statement um, to ensure that they had no conflict of interest um, with anybody that was submitting a proposal to be considered for this RFP. So we feel really good about the process. We engaged a great group of people 
at different elements of the process, which was also a really good way for us to do checks um, as we developed each stage of it. So we received a total of 14 nearshore data proposals. Um, and the diversity, the content, the variety, um, it, it was just amazing what we got truly. Um, we, we received proposals on um, extending 20 years of long-term monitoring to look at climate, climate change on rocky shores, looking at Oregon's nearshore reef habitats, mapping juvenile yellow eye rockfish habitat, carbon sequestration in Oregon tidal marshes, kelp communities, seafloor mapping in the Rogue River Reef Complex, community effects of kelp versus surf grass, um, restoration effects of uh, estuary habitats, and distribution and status of eelgrass meadows. Uh, it was an amazing suite of proposals. And uh, Christina could probably back me up on this as one of the scorers, but it was pretty difficult to do the scoring on these. These, these were very high quality proposals that were received. And the, the last four of those were understanding blue carbon, um, juvenile dynamics of key commercial recreational, key commercial and recreational fish, um, effectiveness of two kelp restoration strategies, and uh, potential habitat and prey resources for sea otters. Okay. So in addition to those 14 proposals, we received, and those 14 proposals were for nearshore data collection, we received two proposals for um, modeling. I'm sorry, we, see, we received one proposal for mod modeling, trophic modeling of Oregon's nearshore reefs. And then we received one proposal in the third category for data portals. And that's to do that $10,000 uh, data portal assessment. Okay, so this is a snapshot of the results of the scoring. Um, the, you'll see that they're listed uh, from top to bottom in terms of ranking. This is how they ranked. So the highest ranked proposal was seafloor mapping followed by Southern Oregon kelp communities followed by juvenile fish dynamics. Those were the three highest scoring near shore data collection proposals. Those proposals totaled 500 in $44,156. The Nearshore Reef Trophic Modeling Project is the one modeling, data modeling project that we received and it totaled 150,000. So the top four projects, three of which were data collection, one of which was data modeling, total almost $700,000. And then of course you see the $10,000 uh, data portal assessment is in there as well for a total, a grand total of $704,000 out of $800,000 available to award. The next list of projects in white are how all of the other proposals ranked out, okay, from top to bottom. So the next one was Rocky Shore, followed by Restoration Effects, et cetera. So the decision points at this point, and Laura, do you, did you want me to turn this piece over to you or did you want me to walk through this and then turn it back to you? It's your call. You're doing a great job, Lisa. <laughs> go right ahead. Okay, Lisa, I'll walk can I through just, it. Can yeah, I go ahead. just jump in for a minute? Sure. Yeah, so if you go back to the previous page, um, previous slide. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted everyone who's on the call to know that it was really, really, really hard to score these because they were all excellent. And I know you said that, Lisa, but the score difference between the uh, the Rocky Shore and carbon sequestration was actually pretty small. So, you know, we just, it was really hard. If we had 2.35 million, we would have been very happy to fund everything. But I just wanted to say that it was... Um, it's a good thing we had, you know, a group doing this and and uh, thank you, Lisa, for facilitating excellent discussion for each of these. Yeah, thanks, Christina. All right, so the decision points. 
So the first one is to make the decision to fund the highest priority nearshore data collection, data modeling, and data portal assessment projects. So that would be those top four projects that would total 704,000. That's the first decision point. And then the second decision point is with those remaining funds, you would want to decide what to do with that, okay? And so the options are to use all the remaining funds, which is a total of 195,844 to fund the next ranked near shore data collection project. So the next one down on the list, if you were to do that, you would postpone any near term future data portal investments. So in other words, you set aside $100,000 for data portal, 10,000 upfront initially to do the assessment, and then potentially investing 90,000 in whatever comes out of that. If you were to select, select option A, you would postpone the expenditure of that $90,000 towards that data portal and put it towards the next highest rank data collection project. Another decision that you could do with that 195,000 is to um, hold all unused funds until you could, until you can secure the additional $85,000 needed to make that next near shore data proposal project whole, okay? So right now, if you were to keep the data portal funding, that 100,000, 90,000 now in data portal, we'd be short 85,000 to support the next near shore data collection project in the list. And so you could just hold on to those funds until you can find the 85,000 to make that project whole. The other thing you could do is not fu consider funding the next near shore data collection project and just shift all of these remaining funds, all 190, into the data portal development project. If you believe data portal is, is a really significant need for the state of Oregon over and above the next highest data collection project. And then you may have other suggestions that, that you might um, discuss doing with those, but those are kinds of the kinds of the options that are available at this point. So I'm gonna just quickly summarize those again, just so we're all really clear. You could fund the next nearshore data collection project in full. If you do that, you would postpone funding any $90,000 contribution to the data portal after the assessment is complete. You could just hold on to those unused funds until you secure an additional 85 to make that next nearshore data portal project, data collection project complete. Or you could just shift all of these funds, adding on to the 90,000 that's currently on the data portal and, and just putting all that money towards the data portal or any other ideas that you may have. So I will turn that back to you, Laura, to help the board navigate that discussion. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lisa. And those options are in no way exhaustive of all of the options. These are a couple that Lisa and I brainstormed. I really wanted an opportunity to see if there were other suggestions or strong feelings. I'm going to throw out one under D, other suggestions, just as an example. You'll note back in our meeting summaries from April and June that we had noted um, that the Department of Fish and Wildlife is, uh, is uh, needing to replace its ROV in the coming years. And it was at one time considered um, as a possible allocation for these funds. We opted to put all of our funds into competitive grant instead. Um, there is still a need for an ROV from Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I had a couple update conversations from staff. If we were to put um, some of these funds or even all of these funds towards that, just know that it would 
probably require holding funds for a period of time while they amass the full $350,000 to $400,000 needed to make that replacement. So they would have to be looking at other sources like are any um, uh, restoration enhancement dollars, the Recreation Conservation Fund, or even recovering America's Wildlife Act and so forth. So it would put it into a hold, but I wanna throw that out as um, another option. So with that, um, can I open it up to other board, any of the board members for discussion on our, on our decision points? I see okay. hands up. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I'm a little slow to respond here. Um, Lisa, would you mind just going back to, or I'm sorry if it's uh, uh, Linda, whoever's controlling the screens, can we go back just to the faces so it's just a little easier for discussion when we um, don't have, there we go. Thank you. Um, so we'll go with uh, Dr. Nielsen and then Steve Marks. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the, the good summary. Um, I, I have um, a, a suggestion to add to the other, um, and then I have a question um, about the, the just the consideration uh, that the panel made in ranking. Um, so one of the suggestions that, that I would add to the, to the uh, possibilities is if we wanted to fund one more proposal, for example, um, another approach could be to negotiate with the awardees or, or just offer slightly less than, than was requested across the board. Um, uh, sometimes that's done, that's not unusual. So uh, it's just a thought um, to add to the mix. So that was my, my one suggestion there. Um, the second uh, uh, point that I, I just wanted to understand a little better how the ranking and discussion went. Um, was it sort of a, 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 you know, a scored ranking, a discussion, and then a re-ranking after discussion? And did, did the panel give consideration to the diversity of topics, um, you know, that were in the legislature? I'm just kind of, I just would love a little more information about that for context. Thank you. Yes. Lisa, can you address that, please? Yes, they they had a score sheet, and every category and subcategory in the score sheet was scored. Um, they there were a couple of adjustments made to the scoring after the conversation occurred, um, primarily because there were it was either two or three categories uh, were accidentally given too many points by the score, more than could have been allotted for that particular category. Um, in addition to that, the reviewers were also given an opportunity to change their scores after the discussion. I And one score did do that in two places, that after the conversation was had, um, he or she went back and said, yeah, you know, now that I think about this, and there was a slight adjustment of the scores. But even with that, I do want to echo what Christina said, and especially for the next five to six projects on that list, there wasn't five to six points difference between those. Yeah. I mean, it was, these are incredible projects that were offered to us. It did I answer all your questions? Karina? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I was curious about that too. Sort of the 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 you know how distinctive are the the rankings? Um, that seems to make it hard, and and maybe that's why I was also suggesting if there's a way to fund more to consider that. Um, anyway, just yeah. And and Karina, just one last comment based on your initial comment. We did have the discussion about going back to each of the individual projects and saying. Would you be willing to trim off 15 or 20? And everyone felt like, if anything, most of these projects in the top 10 were a little bit underfunded, and especially when you consider the amount of overhead. So no one felt good about incorporating that suggestion. That doesn't mean the board can't consider it, but I just want you to know the reviewers did discuss that. Thank you. Thanks. I will go ahead if that's okay, Chair Anderson. 
That's what I was just saying (laughs) (laughs) to myself Um, on mute. Uh, We'll go ahead with Steve and then Christine and then Christina. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa, and to everybody um, involved in evaluating these proposals. I really appreciate all the time and effort put into that. And thank you for the presentation. I had a a couple questions about the options um, listed on that slide that we just went over uh, uh, relative to the data portal piece. Um, and the first question is, um, what what would happen to the data if there wasn't progress made on establishing a data portal? Like, it, good, would the data otherwise be public available, publicly available? Would it not be publicly available? Would it live with the PIs of the respective projects? Or what what would happen to the data collected through those top three projects if there wasn't a, if 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 there were if there wasn't, you know, closure on a data portal um, component of of this funding. So just wanting to make sure that if there is data collection, important data collection that's happening, um, and that we choose to fund another project rather than progressing on a data portal, that that data would still otherwise be available. Um, So I'm not sure if there's information on that. Um, And then the second question I had was, uh, confirming my understanding that the data portal project considered with this funding is is relative to the nearshore data being collected under this funding piece, um, and so thinking about um, just economies of scale and and whether the data portal being considered here would all could also house and and um, disseminate data from say the OAH projects that we are also funding. And whether there or whether this data portal is specific only to um, uh, the near shore uh, piece. Hopefully, those questions make sense. And thanks again for the opportunity to ask. Those are great questions. Um, I think I can address them at least in part. Um, the t- the second part first. Um, the data portal is intended to be a um, long-term data portal for the state that can house all projects so not specific to this yes to the ocean acidification and hypoxia as well as many other uh future future um projects The um, question regarding the public accessibility of the data from any of these OOS projects is, we do require that all those data are publicly available. The limitation that we find is that ODFNW will house data in their data system, so it is accessible by the public, but that's separate from the system that perhaps um, a PI would use from OSU. And then if UST were to contract with another entity that didn't have a data portal, um, perhaps a nonprofit or a private contractor, how do we ensure that those data are publicly available if they don't have that infrastructure? So the data portal project is designed, um, it was developed as a three phase approach to address the long-term needs of the entire state of Oregon and help us link in with regional data sets from other West Coast and beyond um, partners. Um, So the first part right now is just the um, assessment of What's the landscape? What's out there? Who who is currently using what systems and um, solutioning what a proposal would look like for that? The second phase, Lisa, this is where I may need a little bit of encouragement from you, um, but the second phase is to put together a pilot. Um, Am I correct that some of these data would actually be housed on that we could use as a test case and then the third phase is full blown. Can we achieve that for 90,000? No, no way. We're gonna get all the way from A to Z with the existing funds that we have. I think that's one of the reasons why one of the um, decision points is to kind of rake that back and push that into bucket number one for data collection and pending what the results are of the assessment 
take on data portaling as a whole nother strategic project of the OOST for later 2023-2024. Does that answer your questions? And Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? The, the idea is to sort of follow the framework of how the West Coast Ocean Data Portal was developed, but on a smaller scale for Oregon. Um, but Laura's point is good about, we really won't know the landscape until the assessment is done, and that could help drive thinking in terms of scope, scale, and cost. Thank you very much, um, Chair Anderson and Lisa, for that information. That's super helpful. And yes, that that was kind of in what was in the back of my mind as well is is whether the West Coast Ocean Data Portal and I, and I don't see Andy on here, but you know he may have more information on that about whether that could be a stopgap measure in terms of um, uh, providing publicly accessible data until we have a, a our our own program running. Thank you. Thank you, um, Christine. Wow, that's a, that's a lot to uh, absorb quickly here. Um, I, I would like to know, when I saw the comment that Laura, you made in the chat about the list is not in any specific order, um, then what is the number two project that we're talking about? Let me clarify. Um, there was an initial list that was three pages that Lisa put up of all 14 projects. That I didn't want to anyone to feel like that list was any specific order. She then put up the color coded list with the top three and then four or five projects. Those are um, in order of point ranking. And uh, so I, I realized when I put my comment in the chat, it referred to the introduction slide um, and not the color-coded slide that had the dollars request on it. And we're happy to put those slides back up if need be for clarification. So what was the project that we're talking about for the number two slot? This all went very fast for me. Lisa, shall we go ahead and maybe go back to the color-coded slide that shows, yes. So what you see are the top three projects that are within the $600,000 initially oost approved bucket for data collection. And then um, the, the fourth project that says white, that's Dr. Will White, who did the Marine Reserves Assessment. He entered the only um, data modeling project. We originally allocated 200,000 for that bucket, but we only received one proposal totaling 150. So we have a remainder from that that can be applied to this kind of like um, the remainder budget, if you will. The Sea and Shore proposal was also the only one at 10,000. So the question would be, do we fund in full the Mangi proposal OSU for Rocky Shore assemblage and monitorings? My understanding was that that was along with these others, but that was a very highly desired project from the reviewer standpoint. It was just unfortunate. We did not have enough funds to go around. So that's that would be the next one that would be up for funding. I will also say, I think we have an opportunity to request more funds this biennium as per the short conversation with Senator Anderson wherein we can say, look, we received over uh, 14 projects totaling over $2 million. We had less than that to do, but these are high priority projects and the work is still gonna be relevant this year. So can we get a, um, another allocation to complete this list? And, and what I think if I remember from the conversations, it said that, that Christina indicated that 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 was a really close thing. So I, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand with all without all the information. But th this is good, the clarity now, because I, I saw the chat and got confused with that. So 
Thank you. Yes, and we do have all of the scoring sheets um, and the matrices and so forth. We did not opt to put all of the all of that information into the public presentation, but I believe that those PIs can request that information um, and it will be shared with them as to how their um, how how their projects fared with each of the criteria they were scored on. Anything else from you, Christine? No, I, I'm I'm fine. I'll, I'll wait till Christina can comment from the question that I kind of asked about that. Great, uh, Christina. Yeah, I wanted to address a couple of things. Uh, the question about the criteria, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that there were 25 criteria that needed to be scored. And each of those 25 criteria had a different point value. And, uh, and I have to say it was probably the most detailed criteria scoring sheet in, <laughs> in my career I've ever had to use. But it really was very thought provoking because uh, when you have 14 proposals and you're reading each one on their own merit and then uh, looking through the lens of what it is that we're trying to support, uh, it, the scoring was just very close, but it, it felt good that, um, the, that we were all pretty close with our scores for each of these. And then as uh, Lisa mentioned that there was, um, you know, if if there were some scores that might have been one or two points difference, you know, we went back and we talked about those and and uh, had an opportunity to uh, decide whether we were going to keep our point values or or alter them. And so, um, you know, I don't know how to <clears throat> um, how to recommend. Uh, next steps on this either because we brainstormed all the different ways uh, and one of the ideas that <clears throat> was presented was taking you know reducing maybe some of these to be able to uh, fund the next project down but um, but these were so tightly budgeted that it's it's going to be hard even to get them done with the uh, the funding that they are receiving, but I think they're realistic. I, I really believe that the projects that will move forward are going to get done for the funding that um, they have because of also additional leverage from other sources. I hope that helps with uh, putting this in context. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, we have a, a challenging decision before us. I wanna um, make a small amendment to the agenda and that is to allow for public comment in addition to the scheduled public comment at 2.15. I think given the gravity of these uh, decisions as well um, as we might get some good information from the great partners that we have on the call today. Um, so if anyone from the um, public would like to lend uh, please just a couple of, of minutes a piece, um, if possible, to, to this, um, I'd like to entertain that. You can put your uh, name in the chat and I will call on you um, in order. So, um, Lisa, um, do you have any other insights uh, for us from this process on um, the steps, next steps or decision points in front of us? You've given us a, a really good um, overview here. I just wanna make sure that we've got all all the information that we can before we go into decision making. Yeah, I think you do. I mean, it's a really tough decision. I, I can't emphasize that especially the next five to six projects on that list, how close they were. 
Um, in, in some cases, it, it's a matter of a point or two. They're that close. So, um, you know, I do think I do think it's worth going back to one of Karina's original points, which is, did the group consider the diversity of projects after the scoring was done? And they did. They did talk about that. But I do think there's wiggle room for you as a board to talk about that as you look at the next several projects in that list. If if you if you think that restoration effects or eelgrass distribution and status might be uh, might provide a more diverse portfolio and achieve in the short term goals for whatever you believe is important. I think there's space to have that conversation given how close the scoring is. That just adds an additional wrench that doesn't make it easier. <laughs> Yes, um, and I have to also recognize that not being part of the scoring process, um, it's hard to get a sense of what the scope of the whole project is from the keywords that we have provided, but um, we do have the full project um, titles in the preceding series of slides. Um, and we can also ask, I think, Christina and Lisa, who were part of that process, to give us more information if uh, so desired. Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, after we have the public comment, I, I'm hoping that we can have a, a robust discussion again to consider uh, what has just been discussed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and that public comment can happen when we're ready. Um, I think we should have as much discussion as we can. And there are a couple of people in the in the chat wanting to give comment. And I just want to um, reiterate, this is comment just on Nearshore Project awardee selection. If you have comment on any other agenda related or OOST related items, I'd ask you to defer until the 215 public comment time. Uh, Steve. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, just one quick question on the, um, again, on the data portal piece. Is the the project uh, proposal or the proposal by C and Shore, is that, is the output or is the product of that um, a report on options for, I'm just trying to think of what, what form that takes. Is it a is it a is it a list of options for data portal management? Is it a is it a um, is it a suggestion? Is it like a is it like a pre proposal type type thing? Or is it? Um, I'm just trying to um, think about what what the product coming out of that might be. Yes, um, I. Um... Based on their proposal, they will be designing an online survey and having expert review to gather knowledge, preferences, and resources from data contributors like tribes, ocean managers, planners, industry, et cetera. Um, and they would also be researching all of the existing coastal ocean research and data hubs. They're going to collaborate with a coin on all of this and then they will be synthesizing all of those findings into a needs assessment with an inventory of data management systems description of the um, existing assets uh, and finally uh, recommendations for best practices moving forward. Sorry, I was kind of summarizing that from nope. the proposal that they sent in. Thank you. That's exactly what I was was hoping to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it kind of comes down to if we want to keep that data portal 
hub intact, all the 90,000 that we originally approved to allocate towards that, then we don't have enough money to fund an additional data collection project. And we would need to bucket that money until we can get more money or use it in something that's very specific like ROV, even though that's a could be into the next biennium. If we're willing to pull those data hub funds um, until we have a better sense of what direction this whole project is going to go, we can take that plus the unused funds from data modeling and go ahead with just a full next project. And of course, this board can decide on those projects themselves, um, ourselves, and um, if we need to have more time to look at specific projects, then we can do that. Go ahead, Christina. Thanks, Thanks Sharon. Sharon. I wanted I to, are you hearing a reverberation or is it, is it clear? You sound clear to me. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask the question uh, more about the data portal as well. Um, for the remaining $90,000 that were earmarked for that, can you remind me what is the timing on that? Is that something that could potentially wait another year or is that something that is uh, urgent to act on after the $10,000 result, um, the grant is completed? Lisa, maybe you can remind me. I'm not aware of any time uh, constraints that we've placed on those next steps for data portal. Are you? No, I'm not. Um, we won't have the full landscape of what is being proposed until we actually have the assessment itself. So we mm -hmm. really don't have a good idea of the amount of funding it would take to create and sustain this data portal, the data portal until the assessment is complete. Okay, that's that's helpful. Um, the other the other comment that I have is that um, we reviewed these proposals very very thoroughly as a review committee, and certainly I would welcome the other board members to review the proposals if they would like. I would feel a little remiss about changing the priority order of the projects based on um, after doing all the research and, and scoring and discussion that we've had with the proposal review team. However, if, if anyone else would like to um, address some of the questions about the other proposals, we, we certainly could try to do that if you don't want to make the decision today. But it, there was a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about each of those, and we really did try to diversify the project. So even though there were three that were in the top, uh, we felt like those three were were pretty diverse and met the different goals that uh, Oost laid out in the RFP. So just for clarification. Yeah, thank you, Christina. I, um, I concur with your uh, thinking there. I think we have to trust the process and recognize that it's not perfect. But thing, you know, there's proposals at the top, there's proposals in the middle, and there's proposals that were not selected to be at the top, not that they're not worthy, but we have to, I think we have to honor the work that you and the other experts did um, to do the ranking as difficult as it was. And um, in my opinion, uh, use this as a way to get more funding to complete the scope of work that has been put before us. Laura, there's people in the comment yes. box, the chat box. Yes. Um, any other board comments before I open it up for a few members of the public um, at this point? And then we'll come back and see if we can get to a decision here. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Lee uh, Rasmussen, please. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the ROV component in case there were any questions. But um, ODFW has been using ROV for a number of years. It was a cornerstone, you know, of the Marine Reserves monitoring program. A lot of the earlier hypoxia work that was done, kind of looking at the ecological effects, was done that way. Um, so it's a really important tool that not just ODFW, but many agencies, many academic institutions rely on that data going forward. Um, that tool is extremely old. The company no longer manufactures parts. We're at the end of life on that tool. And really to prevent having large data gaps for this really kind of cornerstone piece of equipment, we're needing to replace it. We, like Laura said, we're working with RE. We've submitted a grant for funding there. We've submitted to OCR and F. We're trying to use the Marine program funding. We're we're trying to hodgepodge together money every possible place we can to replace this, but it is a large expenditure. So I just want to highlight that it is an extremely important purchase and it's the impacts go beyond just ODFW. They really extend throughout kind of the ocean community. So I just wanted to mention those things. Thank you. Any questions for Leaf on the ROV? Okay, uh, Peggy Joyce, please. Uh, thank you, Laura. And um, my kudos and deep, deep gratitude and appreciation to the OOST board and to the people that you pulled together to review these projects. Um, OPAC just took a look at 11 projects uh, for coastal uh, marine conservation districts, and it took forever to go through those. So it's really wonderful to see what an actual administration and some money will do for a board that is taking a look at how to uh, study, how to understand the coast of Oregon, which we really don't because we really haven't taken as serious a look as you all have done in the range of these proposals, I just congratulate you on it. And I wanna say, as a member of the public, go to the legislature, hold their feet to the fire, talk to your local representatives, get the League of Women Voters behind you, get every other do-gooder group behind you, because this is such a drop in the bucket for other stuff that is going to get uh, passed in this legislative session for financial consideration, I just highly recommend that you just fight for this. Just fight for this. It's worth it. It is worth knowing every single bit of information that each one of these projects is going to bring to the table. Thank you for that encouragement, Peggy. Any questions from the board? All right, and Bob Bailey. Let's see, here I am. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair Anderson, and thank you to the Boost Board for your work on this. I've gone through a number of processes like this, and it is not easy. Um, I also feel um, Lee Rasmussen's um, pain. Um, I was involved in helping to fund that provide some funds for the ROV that's now going obsolete. So it makes, makes me feel a little obsolete too. I would encourage you to stick with the process as uh, Laura said, uh, and not substitute judgment now um, based on this discussion. Even though there are some projects on that list that aren't funded that I really wish were, I, I think this has been a, a terrific process. I encourage you to sit on the remaining funds to let things ripen. I agree with Peggy. I think uh, beating on the door to say, hey, that was a great start. We've got a little bit more to do here and uh, it's a drop in the bucket. So please help us. I think you've, the uh, OOST, the way it's handled this funding, the entire process, I think it's a credit to not only OOST, but to the legislature. And I think there's an opportunity to go back and uh, add to what uh, has already been put in the bucket, so to speak. But I would encourage you to, to sit on the remaining funds and let things ripen a bit more and fund the ones that uh, the uh, peer review pro or the review process indicated. So that's it. Thank you very much for all your work too. And thank you, Bob, for your work, um, both as an advisor to this process and as a champion for procuring the funding in the first place.
Any questions for um, Bob before we resume our discussion? Okay. Um, thank you. Appreciate the comments. Um, I don't know if that helped to solidify any members thinking strongly one way or the other. Um, is anyone wanting to go out on a limb at this point with their with their strong preference or uh, recommendation? Yeah. <laughs> get more money, right? That's what we all want. And I think that those were that request should be coming from the Oost, and we'll discuss that as a follow-up. Um, I guess I would say um, we could I, um, we could look at this as uh, the four options. Put everything into the next ranked nearshore data collection project, which would pretty much close out the budget for this round of funding um, with the presumption that we would all support going back to the legislature for additional funds. Um, keep the data, keep everything as is, as we said, and just hold funds until we have more funds, but don't touch the data portal um, bucket. Move all funds to the data portal, data portal bucket. I wouldn't say I would strongly recommend that given the uncertainty of the data portal project, but it is an option. And uh, not hearing any other suggestions, the only one that's on the table is to hold funds for uh, the ROV. So again, those are kind of the, the four strategies. I would say, in my opinion, there is an elegance to moving all of this funding through swiftly um, and also uh, just getting projects done now. Um, so option A has a merit, in my opinion, to just getting the funds out working um, in, the, in, the, in the water in this season. Um, I, um, I think when we first started talking about the different buckets, it was a little bit uh, uncertain how we needed to really use the funds. So I don't have any qualms myself about pulling funds from the data portal funding bucket, recognizing that we'll know more after both the um, sea, sea to shore contract is complete and we've done our strategic planning, which we're gonna talk about next on the agenda and that we can go forward for those funds with more, um, with more clarity of what we actually need to get the job done. Um, I definitely see value in supporting the Department of Fish and Wildlife ROV procurement, but honestly, I have a little bit of concern about the timing because um, it could be definitely into the next biennium and beyond for all those funds to come together um, we would be holding on to money um, for an indefinite period of time, um, wherein we could get that money working in the water right now and move forward with our request to include additional support for ODF and W and the ROV in the next biennium. So all that said, I, I am floating myself towards option A, which is to get the money in the water and get it working. Um, I'm going to go, I did not see which order the, the hands went up. I was looking at the decision point screen. So forgive me, I'm just going to go left to right. We'll go Christine, Steve, and then Christina. It's on my screen anyways. i um, like to hear where you're at with that. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> I don't know how you can manage uh, all of this anyway, it's, it's challenging. Um, I, I think we need to get the money out there doing good things. The, the only thing that I um, might bring up here is, is communication uh, and, and outreach. If there's, if there's a way that we can 
uh, if we're if we're going to the legislature for this, and and are there some some components of this where um, some funding could be used to help? Uh, legislators understand the importance of all of this. So I, I, I'm putting that out there. It's, you know, it's what are, what's available uh, from our budgets to do that kind of thing. Uh, and then the other, the other item that I think is really important in, in something that these are all monitoring things, there may be some unforeseen events that happen that, um, that there's additional funding that might be really helpful to make sure they get where they need to go. So ensuring the success of what we've got behind uh, and then thinking about how to translate the, the information and the importance of what, what's going on and the, the greater need to have a more thorough understanding uh, for the next, for next steps. Okay. So communication and outreach to the legislature, which I think, uh, Lisa, we should definitely make sure that we put that into our strategic planning agenda and focus, because that's going to be something this organization is going to need to have ongoing capacity for. And what I think I heard from you is maybe just a holdback of funds for buffering um, projects that perhaps come up against unforeseen circumstances. Uh, Steve? Thank you, Chair Anderson. I think Christina was ahead of me, so I'll, 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 okay. defer and I'll go after her. Thanks. Christina. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to, um, to support where you're coming from, uh, Chair Anderson, that uh, I think getting the money out on the ground working sooner rather than later, I think is really important. And that's why I asked the question about the portal and the urgency, because some of the, the research that is being uh, proposed, I believe is pretty urgent and it takes time to get that data. And so if we could move forward with funding the next project and continue our fundraising efforts and our outreach with the legislature. So I really support what Christine says about doing more legislative outreach and getting information out there about the critical nature of the work that this is funding uh, that hopefully will then get additional funds to do the portal once we get that assessment completed. Um, so my position is that uh, move forward and fund the next project down. Thank you. Uh, okay, Steve. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I uh, likewise am kind of leading that way um, right now, but want to maybe just make, I, I just want to make double sure that I understand all of the options in, inside and out. Um, with respect to option two and option four, if my understanding is correct, the only difference is that option four would earmark that money for the ROV whereas option two keeps the money um, set aside for whatever, for, for whatever decisions we make later. So option two, to me, kind of seems inclusive of option four, um, just minus, the, minus the, the specific targeting of, of where that money is going to be spent at this time as a decision we make today. Um, it, is that correct? Or am I, am I, is, is there something different there that would happen? Um, between option two and option four. If that is correct. And I was just kind of trying to do a little math. Option two says keep the 90,000 to continue pushing data portal funding okay. forward. And, and Lisa, then there's still a remainder of unspent funds of about 105,000, which we would either just hold until we have more funds to fund more projects, or we could allocate to something specific like the ROV. 
Um, is that right, Lisa? You've been doing a lot of the math on this. Did, did I yeah. care? Yeah, it's okay. 105844. Yep. Yeah. So if we keep the if we keep the data portal funding bucket um, untouched, then we still have about one hundred and five thousand unspent. Okay. Thank you. Um, my and it uh, th that's helpful. And and again, I'm still leaning towards um, I think where you are, Chair Anderson, and where Christine is as well. Um, but my last question is. Um, what uh, is 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 about what types of requirements um, are placed on this funding? And I'm wondering if this if this if the funding could be used for projects uh, near shore projects that um, need a match or or if there are and I'm, I, I'm thinking the answer to this is no. so I'll, I'll just stop asking it, but I'm just wondering if there's something else out there. Um, that that uh, meets a need meets an immediate need, um, but I think absent anything jumping out, I I think that I am likewise where where you are. Yeah, no, I I get where you're coming from, and I think um, in my opinion, the answer is we should be able to consider anything within the realm of supporting near shore research as per the intent of the funds but opening up this robust of a process to do so would might be overly cumbersome. So that's my concern is opening up the process. I bring the ROV forward because it's in the meeting summaries as something that was discussed and contemplated already. Um, but there, um, yeah, there would have to be like to be a match or something. We'd have to go through a, a weird competitive mini process. Understood. Um, Karina, go to your hand up, but I'd love to hear what you're thinking at this point. We know from hang on a sec. Um, I I am in favor of of sort of getting uh, things in the water um, sooner. So I I didn't speak up because I'm basically in, in agreement with that. Okay. And and pursuing additional funding because as as we saw, there's a lot um, that I think is missing from the portfolio in terms of the the areas of interest. I think the ROV is a very important um, priority for the state. Uh, something else that I think you know we should be pursuing perhaps um, in some way. So so I'm basically in agreement, I guess, with the where we're leaning. Okay. All right, well, I'm hearing a lot of support for that. So I would um, like to clarify what um, what I'm hearing and uh, perhaps request a motion from the board that uh, the OOST recommend or the OOST's decision is to fund the top four highest priority near shore data collection projects, the data modeling project, and the data portal assessment project as presented. Um, and this doesn't have to be part of the motion, but my understanding is that that's going to result in a remainder of about $5,500, which in the context of a million dollar budget is couch change. So I don't think we have to worry about that too much. We would just roll that into the... Um, into the East administrative budget. So uh, is Lisa, is that what you um, heard as well? I just kind of asked because you have been tracking this so diligently. Yes, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, so that shows the Rocky Shore assemblage monitoring moved up into the top and these are the new numbers. That takes us to right under 900,000. Do I hear a motion? Still moved. Second. I second. Okay, and so uh, just for Linda's note-taking purposes, 
Um, a motion has been made and seconded to fund the four highest priority near shore data collection projects, the data modeling project and the data portal assessment project totaling $894,578. All in favor, say aye. Aye, aye. aye. raise aye. your hand. And any opposed? All right, hearing none, we have done it. Nice work, everyone. All right. I want to take a break right now. <laughs> this is very intense. So much good work hanging. But before we do, I do want to, um, I think the next agenda item is going to be a little shorter um, than expected. And it's really just a continuation of what our conversation was. So we, um, after the break, we're going to talk about um, Strategic Planning and Science Summit, but uh, we have a need to get a funding ask in now for this legislative session. Um, my, what I hear, what I heard, and what I think we would recommend is that we request at a minimum, and this is a discussion, so I'm just gonna throw this out there as just a conversation starter, um, a legislative ask of a million dollars um, at a minimum to complete the nearshore projects. Um, we would probably, I don't know if we would open a, the RFP process again and those people would, would apply or we would just fund based on the previous RFP if we're successful in getting that funding. That's a question. Um, I would also uh, want to bring forward something that I've been hearing in the OOST meeting, um, specifically from uh, Karina Nielsen, um, as she's been um, just in the last few meetings, and also some conversations I had with Charlie Plyman at Surfrider, which is a need for the state to step up and fund uh, science and research re related to literal cell um, planning and sandy shore areas. Um, we had some conversation about the purview of the oost and whether it's stopped at the high tide line. Um, I think my recollection from all of those conversations was that no, um, ecosystems don't work that way and we shouldn't either. So we extend our purview into estuaries and beyond the high tide line as well. So um, that said, I think that there could be at least an additional million dollars uh, requested to help support those science needs as well. Um, if we're going in for a funding request, I'd like to open it up to the board to um, give some guidance to, to me on what we would include in a one pager in addition or in lieu of those two things. I do see a comment sure. from uh, Jean Strait that depending on the timing, if it's longer than six months, we may need to redo the grant process. But having a process in place and PIs that have already wrote uh, projects might help to facilitate some speed on that. Uh, we'll go, and again, I'm sorry, I didn't see what order hands went up in. So Steve and then Christine. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, just just um, wondering a little bit more about the, the literal cell uh, concept that you just raised. Is there, if we're going to put that into a legislative ask, um, and, and if that legislative ask needs to be approved by by us, um, is there more information on, on, on that that we could look over? Yeah, I had 
wanted to have something more robust to propose to this board and did not uh, do the research needed to do so. Um, I would perhaps ask Karina if she might be able to give us a broader sense. That, but before I, I ask her to respond, I would just say a couple of the things that I've been hearing is the legislature should be concerned about the needs of the state in managing infrastructure in particular in these dynamic environments. So there's an economic basis for this kind of research. Um, they have mitigation processes and goal, nine, goal 18 and, and armoring and all these kinds of policy um, decisions that they make on a growing basis. So what science can help support that? There may also be a nexus with wind energy and impacts to littoral cells, which is a very timely topic right now. So um, Karina, you have so much experience here. Can you give us a little more? I can. I, I wasn't um, entirely prepared for this topic to come up. Uh, so it's, this will be extemporaneous a bit remarks. But um, the literal cell concept is, is something that's been uh, developed sort of for understanding the both the ecology and the physio biophysical aspects of of sandy beach ecosystems and the nearshore surf zones associated with them, um, and uh, there has been some recent science modifying that a bit more, uh, which might be interested to interesting to look at, but. Um, one of the things that happened in California, it also happened here, is that with so much attention on the visible biodiversity of the um, rocky shore habitats, um, is that the sandy beach habitats, estuaries, et cetera, I mean, it's variety of habitats, but particularly sandy beach for the outer coast have been um, not well represented in the, the sort of the research portfolio, if you will, and in the priorities in the, in, in, in the state policy. So um, there are economic drivers, as you mentioned, there's the issues around um, the loss of beach habitat um, and the, what, something that folks call the coastal squeeze as you come up to um, development along the coastline or seawalls or revetments and things that people into, put in to protect against erosion. There's a lot of new developments around dynamic revetments and research on engineering of more green type infrastructure to manage some of sea level rise erosion habitat loss issues. So I think it's an area ripe for uh, improving our understanding, both uh, from a technical science basis, but also from a policy uh, to inform policy uh, around those issues going forward. Uh, you brought up uh, another interesting layer, uh, which is the, the um, wind energy um, off floating offshore wind, which I think there's a lot of a whole host of questions there. There certainly could be some potential for intersection, I guess, with um, wave energy arriving on the shore and what those impacts might be. But I, I think that's that's you know just sort of at this point uh, <laughs> more arm waving than details uh, in terms of the technical basis for that statement. Um, but it seems like a logical thing to to look at. A um, uh, lot more to learn there. So. Um, I, I hope that helps a little bit. I'd be happy to dig in deeper, um, you know, as a committee offline or, or to go a little deeper on, on those topics and develop uh, a framework um, with other board members or working group. Um, but I, I think that that kind of frames up the issue, at least initially. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nielsen. Um, and I guess my two, just to, as a quick follow up, um, from what you just said, it, it's the, the concept, if, um, first of all, I assume we, we'd have enough, we know enough about it to include it in a, like you said, Chair Anderson, a one pager or a legislative ask or, or something like that. Um, and then secondly, my understanding from what was just discussed is that it's not, not necessarily limited to sandy beach habitat, but um, with respect to you know, sea level rise planning, um, thinking about my, my um, you know, habitats migrating um, uh, inland and, and how do we prepare and adapt to that and maintain ecosystem function in the near shore and coastal zone. Um, would, that, would, that, would that work um, also include, you know, things of uh, habitats that aren't just sandy beaches, but like you said, um, estuaries or um, salt marsh, um, 
tight th those intertidal areas. Well, um, yeah. maybe, maybe, I, I don't want to I don't want to belabor this the, the discussion, but just trying to think is, is this uh, an ask related just to sandy beaches um, or or would it be broader than that? Um, that's a good question, and uh, I I would really uh, if we decide to move forward with this as part of an ask, I would definitely take Dr. Nielsen up on her interest in just helping to craft it because really all Senator Anderson and Representative Gomberg want is a one pager, so it's going to be pretty general. I think that we should be as inclusive as possible. When you look at the in-water work that we're doing on nearshore rocky habitats, et cetera, there are some limitations there. Ocean acidification, hypoxia um, group of projects was a whole nother suite. So being able to encompass from shorebirds to you know those kind of intertidal um, zones, I think would be good in this. Um, in this realm. And I could see this as a kind of a um, uh, strategy that perhaps we'll talk about when we get into strategic planning of being able to do ocean acidification, hypoxia, near shore, and then more of this literal cell um, management in kind of waves so that we're not, you know, taking on everything all at once. So by the time we get this funding, if we're, if we're successful in getting funding and getting it out the door, then our OAH projects are gonna be completing and we could go into another cycle. So I see this as a potential cycle for us as OOST in terms of being able to address that whole ecosystem area. Um, Christine, you have your hand up. Yeah, I guess um, not having having a fleshed out proposal on this issue, I, I guess I go back to um, a, a, a serious concern that I have about um, bringing in the near shore into estuaries in a very clear fashion. And uh, there were, uh, I guess, a couple of Funding of, of fun, non funded projects that were, it looks like they were dealing with that. Um, but in terms of understanding blue carbon and sequestration that, that comes on over to ocean acidification and mitigation strategies, um, I, I can't emphasize enough of the importance of that. And that certainly has the total spin offs in it looking at any kind of developmental strategy for um, that's going on in the in the in the uh, offshore wind issues, uh, port development, uh, all of the dredging and proposed uh, events that that are that are concurrent with some of those development issues uh, are are just um, they're they're big monsters that are out there, and I think the estuaries are a critical resource that we are really not connecting in terms of the, the energy transfer from land <clears throat> uh, through the river systems out that feeds the the um, the other parts of the ocean. So I, I, I guess I'm speaking that if we're if we're raising up an additional million dollars, it I think it needs to be really broadly fo focused to uh, improve the understanding of all the habitats that are related, particularly with um, climate change and uh, sea level rise. If I might just add, augment that remark. Um, thank you, Christine, for those comments. You know, the connectivity between these nearshore habitats are, is pretty important, especially as you start looking at the sandy beach ecosystems. Um, they receive a lot of inputs of energy and matter from the rocky intertidals and the estuaries. And so the connections between these nearshore habitats are, are quite remarkable and important if we are if we are really trying to think about all of them uh, as a collective um, um, and their well-being. Uh, it, it would behoove us to invest in understanding all of them, not just uh, piecemeal sort of one habitat at a time.
Okay. Um, did not expect to hear any dissent on asking for money. So this is good. I don't know that we need a motion um, to write a one pager. Jean, do you think we need a motion to write a one pager or is this just kind of a, this is where my uncertainty with the state process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, don't think you need it. Um, I think that it, it might be nice. I mean, LFO or someone may want that, that the board directed, you know, the board directed to go out okay. and seek more money. It's always better safe than sorry, in my right. opinion. You're all here. <laughs> We're all here. Okay. I would love, um, so, uh, I, my, um, my gut says a $2 million request, a million for Nearshore um, and a million for um, literal cell estuary relative to climate change, sea level rise um, as per Christine's comments and that uh, um, perhaps Dr. Nielsen and I would work on that to get that in pretty quickly. I'll draft something up and, and run it by you. Um, is that too low of an ask or any comment or concern on that? Well, I'd like to just ask uh, because I'm also very interested in the ROV and mm -hmm. would that be part, would full funding for that be part of the near shore or is that going to be a uh, a specific earmark ask how how would you handle that my god says why would the legislature give us money just to pass it through to odf and w rather than just give them money themselves so i think that would be at our discretion because we have the ability to make direct allocation and run competitive grants that we wouldn't necessarily include that in the ask as a call out. I think it might uh, conflict with other requests that they have in POPs or otherwise. So I'd say if we got a million for near shore, we would come together just like we did last time. And maybe we say, okay, let's give this much as a direct allocation to that. Um, I don't know any other, that's just my gut sense. Any yeah, other? I'm comfortable with that. I, okay. I would prefer not to have that be, you know, like earmarked within or mentioned within. I think it's a separate issue. I agree too. It's a separate, it's an important one. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it could, um, it could show up somewhere else. It would be really nice if they had some committed funds and they knew exactly what they needed to get the job done. And if it timed out for us to be able to help fill that that last mile for them, that that might be um, it might time out well that way. So, OK, so just waiting, uh, just need a, a motion to direct me to um, develop a one pager for the legislature for two million dollars of funding. Be so moved. Second. I'll second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Sounds good. Um, we can take a break a few minutes early. Um, let's see. We said 1.45 to 2 o'clock. It is 1.36. Um, let's come back at 10 minutes to 2. And I have a feeling we'll be able to wrap up this agenda early. That would be nice. That would be nice. Sherry Anderson, if I could just let you know, I do, uh, I have a unfortunate, I have to leave at 2.30. So okay. um, if we end early, that's great. But if there's anything you need from me before then, I just wanted to alert you. I'm shooting for 2.30. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We'll see you all back here in 13 minutes.
right, welcome back everybody. Get some leftover stir fry on my break. I feel my blood sugar is a little better now. <laughs> that was a pretty intense decision-making process we had there. It's really incredible to be able to work with this group and uh, so much insight and engagement. And it's so cool to see how much um, how much our board is involved in these projects from whether it's developing the RFPs or doing the scoring. Steve, you were really instrumental in the ocean acidification hypoxia as well. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a great group to work with. Um, all right, well, we'll resume our meeting. And so that said, we're a great group to work with. We've got some really good um, feathers in our cap, so to speak, at this point. Um, and I think I can speak at least for Christina and I being founding board members and going through the drudgery and the arduousness of creating rules and figuring out our, our um what our purview is and actually just getting the um, getting the authority to do this kind of work and do these projects. It's so great to be getting money out and on the ground. It's also become a little bit clear that we have been, I would say, a little lucky at times. Um, and we've had some good opportunities brought to us that we were able to take and turn into the work that you saw today. Um, I think a real next step for this organization is to get more proactive on what it is that we want to see for this organization and its role in supporting the state and research and science. And in order to do that, we probably need to do some strategic planning, <laughs> which depending on who you are, either you love it or you hate it. I'm one of those geeks that really love strategic planning. I, I just really do. I find it creative and I find it fun. I really love learning uh, different processes and ways to go about strategic planning. I've been um, privileged to sit on boards uh, that are really, really good at strategic planning, and I've learned a lot from that process. Um, so we have the need to do that for the OOST, and Lisa is going to lead us in um, a kind of a brief discussion just to see if we can get something on the books, if you will, for all of us. And also tangential to that is the need to do a, um, a renewal, if you will, I don't know if that's the right word, of our Ocean Science Summit and getting our science body together in the state to dust off um, the work that was done in 2016 and see what has changed and what has not and use that to help guide our efforts too. So Lisa, um, do you want to take us into a discussion of how that might look? Sure thing. Let me um, queue up this slide presentation. OK, I just have a couple of quick slides here. You can see that, Laura? Yeah. OK, I keep getting the, these weird messages from Zoom. Where'd she go? I think oh, we lost Lisa. Okay, she... I'm back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my Zoom quit. Okay, so in terms of strategic planning, I'm also an advocate of strategic planning. However, I'm an advocate of very streamlined, efficient strategic planning. I am not a fan of huge documents, weeks at a time, days of holding people hostage or anything like that. I think we can be super efficient, come up with a really nice short document that reflects your highest priorities. So that's essentially what we're talking about, pulling all of you together for a session, looking at what you've done in the past, what you originally envisioned for this organization, 
maybe a short SWOT analysis that we can get done in advance of the meeting, um, refine any mission, vision, and goals statements, be really clear and articulate about what your objectives are going to be in the short and long term. And I just started listing a few of them uh, based, oops, based on the conversation from today. Um, you all talked about uh, communication and outreach to legislators, littoral cell research, wind energy, wave energy impacts to shoreline, maybe another cycle of OAH nearshore funding. So there's a suite um, of opportunities that are available for you to articulate as priority actions. And then maybe a discussion about how you evaluate success um, and what indicators or metrics that you want to use. And it can just be a couple of them, but it's a way of looking back over a few years and saying, yeah, we said we would do this, we did this. What kept us from implementing that fully? Um, or what did we do that really helped make that successful that we can mod um, model it for the future? And maybe a real strategic discussion about budget and fundraising, um, and maybe aligning those fundraising goals with what your priority actions are. So I think what we're talking about is a real concise, short, three to five year sort of vision plan. Um, and just a, a short one to two pager that's an annual work plan that describes um, what you want to do um, and that sort of thing. So I think the key question is, and I, I change back to this screen just so I can see your faces again, um, is the, the when and where. Do you like the idea? Um, and if so, when would you like to do it? And where is your preference for doing it? Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, any um, feedback at this point? Christine, oh. perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I was just uh, saying it. I, it needs to be in person if it's going to be effective. I don't, we can't sit in our Zoom meeting and make it effective. <laughs> and, and I love Newport, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I kept threatening to have an in-person meeting for the last, I don't know, maybe three or four meetings. And I just, uh, I find it so convenient just to be able to come onto Zoom. But we did it this way in January because we know that traveling can be quite treacherous in the state. So if we're looking to the end of winter, early spring, then yes, uh, we can use this as an opportunity to come together. Uh, do people uh, feel pretty strongly that we should do this, just kind of a show of hands, that we should do this in person together as opposed to this way? I see some nodding. Yeah, right. definitely in person. Um just been through this with the Gorge Commission and we can only do this in, in person because uh, the Zoom, there, there's so much benefit to being able to just even talk during breaks and you know brainstorm that way. So yeah, I, I would suggest maybe early May. And uh, I think that gives us enough time to actually plan this effectively. Um, yes, and um, I guess I would say, do we have to wait that long, February, March, April? I guess that's three months out. Lisa and I talked about this a little bit, and um, one of my concerns was who's going to facilitate it and how much will it cost? And she said ever so graciously, I would love to facilitate this and I can do this within the scope of my existing contract, which both things were music to my ears. So I presume that our board would support, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up for that. So we don't need to go out to find a facilitator. And Lisa, help me uh, remember what we talked about in terms of, did we think this was just like a one day just like a, a full a full day, Kath? What was the thought there? I think we can do it in something like a nine to three or or something like that, give people some travel time if they need it. I you know, any more spending a full day eight to five in a meeting, it just doesn't work for most people. And I think you get the best out of people when you do a lot of good front-end work 
you bring them together to have the great discussion. They go back, then they have a chance just to review that and provide their feedback. So I'd say something like a nine to three with a lunch included, and we can we can make that happen. Okay. Um, and so that's the how long and who will do it. Um, how do you? How do you feel? I'll feel about. Oh, hi, Steve. Go ahead. Thanks, Jay Anderson. <clears throat> um, just thinking about um, notification and required processes and things like this. Would would this be a public meeting that would need to be noticed and announced? How how would we need to provide time for public comment? Like just thinking about the logistics. Uh, my understanding is that if we're all in the room together, it's necessarily a public meeting, right? So so it would. <clears throat> We would need to find the right space to accommodate that, and um, Newport is great. Sure, yeah, if, if if that works, and and I look certainly look forward to it. Um, yes, it would fall under public meeting laws and would be open to the public. So having good um, AV accessibility and ADA accessibility would be important. Perhaps uh, someplace at Hatfield would be um, appropriate because they have all of that. And uh, Karina. <laughs> you can probably has, figure something out there. <laughs> yeah, some connections there. Jeff, Jeff Barth was on the call with us earlier too. We might be able to pull a string or two. I'm sure it wouldn't <laughs> be a problem to get into one of the beautiful new rooms at the um, MSI building or, or something like that. Um, time frame wise, um, I think we'd probably just have to doodle pull it um, within a certain range. Are there um, any other um, proposals besides early March or any concerns about early March or other time windows that we should consider? I think I said May. I'm sorry, May. Really? May, yeah. <laughs> March. Yeah, that's a little soon. Uh, May. Well, I, I'd actually be supportive of something a bit earlier, um, but it sort of depends on what people's schedules are, because I think it would help. Um, I we have to think about our ask and everything that to try to get to get a nice strategic plan draft out um, would be would be to our advantage uh, for, for our, our overall institution. Yes, um, would, Christina, would you consider, and Lisa, would you be able to get us prepped to do it for our actual sl regularly slotted um, quarter two? meeting time, which is uh, April 5th. Yes, on my end. Uh, yeah. yeah, I could try. Um, okay. Work-wise, it might be a little challenging because we're a few people short on staff due to maternity leave. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure how much time I could devote in February. Uh, and early March, but um, I'll work with Lisa. Whatever dates you guys decide on doing this uh, through the doodle poll, we'll just make it work. Okay. Um, I, Lisa, we don't have, I think normally like for our April quarterly board meeting, we would have been queuing up some updates from our OAH grant recipients on some of their project reports, or was most of that um, in the fall? Most of that was in the fall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a pretty open slot for April 5th. Um, that does give us a couple of months to get some reading. I think with Lisa's good guidance, I know that we'll be able to get through it. So let's see if we can get some traction around that. And if not, then we'll select another time. Um, anything else on that 
process at this juncture, Lisa? Nope, more to come. Okay. I think one of the things that I really want to set us up for for success is as this organization grows and continues to take on more projects, how do we staff that? We have Lisa under contract for very specific things, but there are needs outside of what her contract scope is. So um, I think for me, that's gonna be a big priority for um, making sure we set up for success on that. All right, and then how about the Science Summit? Lisa, where are we? Yeah, so if it's okay, I'm going to keep this a little bit smaller screen available here just so I can see all of you. It helps to not just be talking at a computer. Um, so we did the first one in 2016 in Newport. It was a two-day meeting. We convened about 25 ocean experts. Um, actually, I think that number should be 45. I may uh, yeah, have, it was more that's than a typo. That. It, it should okay. be 45, sorry. Um, and we brought everybody together to identify priority research and monitoring funding needs for Oregon's near shore. And the cool thing we did is we made it scalable. So we said, if we had X number of dollars, what would the desired funding projects be? And then if we had another package that was this additional funding, what would we do? And then if we did this, the Cadillac version, or I guess now the Tesla version, what would it be? So that was a really good model that really appealed to people, that scalability. And so I would encourage the group to think about that as a, in using that model. The format of the event is that we brought, um, we asked experts in different fields like Francis Chan and others to give really short presentations just to highlight some key issues. So we would need to identify if you wanted to follow this model you know, a handful of people that could really provide the state of the science on certain topics that are really important that all of you would like to see discussed. And then the task for these work groups, and we broke everybody up into work groups, and over the next day and a half, they all worked on developing specific research questions that Oregon needed to answer to address the highest priority in Oregon's near shore. Um, so you you may like that model. You may want to try a hybrid version of that. It seemed to work pretty well. The outcomes of that drove uh, a lot of the platform and foundation for what the OOST eventually uh, initiated its priorities on. So the proposal is that since this summit was, what, 2016, quite a bit of time has elapsed. Quite a bit has changed. We know more than we did in 2016. Um, and we've conducted more research and we now have new data gaps that we did not realize at that time, right? So that it's, that it's changed. Um, so the idea is to bring this group of 40 to 50 people together, together again, um, and, and maybe one would argue not limit it only to Oregon, given that we are on the West Coast, we deal with a lot of California current issues, maybe there's other folks you wanna bring in as well, just something to think about. Um, and, and you just reboot, talk about what the latest priorities are now, what we should be thinking about in the next three to five years, um, and, and really go through a similar and or modified process, but be, create that new list of emerging priorities um, for the state of Oregon. And the question would be when and where, and you could use the outcomes of this summit to modify the work plan of the OOST as well as your strategic plan should you decide to do so, because that should be a living, breathing document. Lisa, um, I remember that summit well. It was excellent, and it uh, it really paved the path for how, um, how we operated. And we were lucky enough to get a grant for that summit. I remember, was it the Nature Conservancy that helped us with that? Yes, that was part of the funding. Laura, do you remember who else funded that? I don't, but there was indication that to me that the Nature Conservancy might be willing to assist again, whether that is with their own funding or bringing partner funding. Um, 
seems to me we did this for under 50,000 and that oh, included yeah. travel for everybody and meals for two days and overnights, et cetera. So um, those are nice numbers to work with to get multiple partners in, you know, at 20,000 or, you know, get a few partners in at that level. Yeah, and we didn't have um, the new MSI building or access to things like that at the time. So we spent a lot on the hotel piece of it and the meeting room and all that. So I, we probably could get by with it even being less expensive if those facilities or something like that were available to us. And so I noticed- something like, oh, go ahead, please. Just wanted to say, Laura, that Bob made a comment in the um, chat box that, the Alaka Alliance is doing a sea otter science symposium for October 17th. It's likely going to be virtual, but they, they as an organization would love to participate in a science summit is what his notes say. Yeah, and I was just um, recognizing it's a longer lead time to get this on the calendars of so many people. So we're probably looking at a minimum of six months of lead time yeah. planning time. So that would put us into August, which is of course summer. So maybe we'd be looking at October of 2023 as a reasonable time frame. I don't know, does that resonate? Uh, yes. Gives us a chance to do some fundraising around it and um, get the save the date out there. In maybe even November, you might want to consider before the holidays, early November, just because it gets mm -hmm. kids back to school and everything kind of back in sync and people seem, it seems like a pretty good time for this kind of thing. I don't know. It always feels like everybody thinks that. So my <laughs> November calendar is crazy because everybody <laughs> says, let's do it in November. Yeah. Nothing's going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. But I think, uh, you, um, you know, with that kind of lead time, maybe we can just select a day sometime between late September to mid-November and get a save the date out there. We can use our existing document as our, you know, evidence for some, I think, what should be fairly lightweight fundraising around this. So, um, yeah, should be, should be a reasonable lift. I think a lot of people want to see this. I get requests, uh, like, are you going to do that again? Like, we really need that. That was, that was good stuff. So, all right. Um. <clears throat> Chair Anderson, this is Steve, just real quick. Um, I wanted to flag that <clears throat> looking at that time frame, um, the, the uh, Coastal and Estuarian Research Foundation is having their national meeting in Portland. Um, that's right in the middle of November, six, uh, I think the 12th to the 16th. And there will be, and that's a national, it's a pretty big meeting. And that's, I think it's at the convention center um, <clears throat> or somewhere in Portland, but there will be a lot of, uh, West Coast and Oregon uh, uh, folks at that. Um, and I know that folks that we work with at NOAA are, are pr presenting on some nearshore habitat um, and nearshore ecosystem stuff there as well. So just thinking about, <clears throat> uh, you know, thinking about synergies uh, with, with the information that's going to be there and the people that will be in the area. Mm -hmm. Right. So just to add, I mean, there's the opportunity to, you know, be adjacent and take advantage. That can also be a lot, uh, depending on what else is going on. You know, there's often also in that time of year, I know this year we had very tight overlap at Hatfield with uh, an internal research summit and um, that a lot of people were involved in, and that was right adjacent to then the state of the coast um, meeting. Oh, so cool. that's all kind of in that, that time frame so I just just some other things that people who you probably want to engage with may be involved with great so I yeah, guess I, I I'm think... suggesting maybe before November or even though there is the advantage advantage of potentially being adjacent to surf but um 
Yeah, I think one of the challenges is to keep it very focused and very tight. Um, so we were successful in really positioning this as defining the science needs for the state of Oregon relative to the ocean. But we do work in a bigger context and there's a need to synergize with our neighboring states as well. So we're gonna have to figure a little bit of that out. Um, but I, th I think uh, we have enough planning horizon. We'll have some time in our strategic planning where we can talk about this a little bit more, but suffice it to say, we'll put it on the, um, on the work plan for late fall, early winter, or sometime between September, October, November, 2023. Looks like we did it in May of 2016. I don't wanna wait that long and I don't wanna do it that soon. So. <laughs> Other comments, concerns, ideas on the Science Summit? Okay, look at that, right on cue for public comment. Um, is there anyone in the Zoom room that would like to give public comment on anything on the agenda or otherwise here today. Type your name in the chat if you would and I will call on you. I can even find the chat. There it is. All right, not so many folks on the meeting today, a little bit light. Uh, it's all good. I think they all just wanted to see where the money was going to go. <laughs> I know I would be. Okay, uh, so going once, going twice on public comments. Excellent. Um, I guess that just moves us into the final part of the agenda. I did invite um, Congresswoman Bonamici staff to update us today and um, they were unable to attend, so um, suffice it to say, I don't think that there was a ton to update. Um, the email that I received from staff just stated that uh, the Congresswoman was very, you know, felt very good about the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act. I'm not familiar with those. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about in our strategic planning is how to get more um, direct line on some of these federal funding opportunities as they come available, because I personally think that that's one of the ways that OOST can really add to the amount of funding that we have in the state without competing for or with in the private foundations realm, um, but also um, just noting some other work and that they had some staff changes um, as well. So hopefully for our next meeting, we'll be able to get uh, more federal update. I think there's been also some changeover in Senator Wyden's office as well. So uh, suffice it to say, I have nothing else there. Um, and uh, before we just take, allow for any other member updates, I just wanna recognize that Lisa had a, uh, received and asked staff to attach to the meeting announcement a uh, summary um, of some of the OAH funding. And I thought Lisa, perhaps you could just give us a really quick update on where that project process is and how things are going with our fundies. Yes, sure thing. So I'll just share the screen for you just so that you can see. These are the OAH projects uh, that were funded. Um, and so all of the projects now have signed contracts. They've all received their first invoice, which is 50% of the project funds that allowed them to get equipment purchased, things kick-started. Um, they're in the process of getting ready to present 
at the annual OAH meeting that ODFW sort of puts together on behalf of the council. So those invites have gone out. Um, and, you know, in terms of the OOST's role, we're not using the website to interpret their science or do anything. We're just kind of showing this is what the OOST funds. These are what the projects are about. Um, but we're carefully monitoring how these projects are being implemented. We do work hand in hand with ODFW on the reporting. Um, if they have problems getting reports on any of the projects, I generally help out and nudge a little bit. And they also report directly to us. And that's what that package is um, that all of you received. It's the short report that we ask them to produce to us. It's sort of an interim report. So it's all going great. You're going to start to see um, the results of their work beginning this fall. Uh, most of them opted to begin to share the initial results halfway to three quarters of the way through their project beginning this fall. So it's pretty exciting um, to see some of the work that they're doing. I think you guys are going to be intrigued with this communications plan and some of this outreach messaging. That's been pretty interesting, um, but much more on that to come. Um, but everything's on track and going very well. And thanks again to the great folks at DSL. They're working hand in hand with us um, to make sure that all of this is, is above board and um, all the contracts have gone out, et cetera. Yeah, thank you to DSL staff and to you, Lisa, for managing that so well. I think it's just uh, going to make it easier for us to continue to move funds through, showing our track record on these first few allocations. So, uh, any questions from the board on the report or on the process for the OAH projects? I did want to bring up. Um a question about the grants that we made today, but then also I guess that carries over to this. Do we do press releases for announcing these grants? Could we use this as an opportunity for, um, once we notify the, the grantees, of course, um, to be able to actually use this as a, a way of uh, publicly showing how we're, funding these projects and, and how it's meeting our mission? Yes, um, we have done um, press releases and we will do ones on, on this new round as well, if Laura, you think that's still appropriate. We always try to reach out to legislators to get quotes from them. Um, so we'll do that as well, like we did in the last round, if you'd like to do that, Laura. Um, but we got pretty good response when we put it out as press releases. Yeah, with the OAH funding, we had the benefit of having the OAH Council working with us. And so uh -huh. ODF and W and OAH Council took a real strong lead in getting those press releases out. But I think I learned enough about the process to where we can replicate that um, with uh, between, uh, between Lisa and me. And Christina, if you want to be involved in that, I would really appreciate it as well, or anyone for that matter. But yeah, Christine? I was just going to add that, you know, the um, that the public outreach uh, pro, pro project that they've got going um, there, I guess they're going to give an update to OPAC meeting on Friday. But I, I really think that we need to um, to make sure that we've got public outreach as well. And it's really important um, to keep keep that out there, the information flow and, and the enthusiasm uh, for what's going on. Because, um, you know, scientists tend to stay in their little silos and communicating science to the public and even the public to understand it is um, it's an area where we really need to work harder. Yeah, thanks, Christine. You yeah, know, I Please rebroadcast, you know, if, if it goes out on social media, it's easy for us to boost the circulation of the announcements and any messaging. Um, I just, you know, I think a lot of our partner organizations could help with that if we ask them. Other member updates or things that uh, 
Um, we need to put on near future agendas or Steve. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I don't have an update. I just I had a question before we adjourned, and I was remiss in not asking this under the agenda item, but um with the look thinking back to the one page, the legislative one pager and developing that, um, is that something that we'll get to see before it gets transmitted to the legislature? Or is that something that 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 um you and, and Dr. Nielsen are gonna work up and just send? I'd, I'd love to take a look at it before it goes to the to the legislature, but just uh, but thinking back to that conversation, um, I should have asked and, and I'm just not 100% clear on that. Yeah. Um, Lisa, do, can you, the one concern that we have if we do anything via email is if I can't send an email to all of you lest it be potentially construed yeah. in a public meeting. So I think uh, the best approach to that would be just to uh, work it up and to send it to those of you that want to see it and have a chance to review it. We'll just have to do that um, more individually, I'm not trying to skirt the public process, but we need to be sensitive to it as well. Um, is that? That that I I don't want to put anybody any extra work on anybody's shoulders, but just it's would be not interested. extra work. Okay. It's just kind of a, it's just one of those weird things just, that I've had to get used to. <laughs> just knowing, knowing that, you know, some, if I get asked questions about that, or if I, I just want to, just want to be aware of what's in there and so that I can um, have that information. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be pretty short and pretty broad as per the guidance I've been given by people who do these things regularly, so. Thank you. Anything else for this meeting? Uh, lest we belabor it, we may be able to adjourn a little early. All right, well, thank you all and uh, look forward to our next meetings and I will get in touch with those of you as needed for the direction on the one pager. Great, thank you. Thank you for a great meeting. All right, meeting Thanks. adjourned. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.